In this episode, we're going to be talking about spiral dynamics areas of application. And you'll have to excuse me because I still have a cold. That's why I sound kind of stuffy. My nose is clogged up and I might need to blow my nose here and there as I'm talking. So, but anyways, let's uh, get right into the topic. So at this point, if you've watched my mini series, my multi-part series on spiral dynamics, you should have a very good understanding of the theory of spiral dynamics and that should help to explain a lot of stuff to you about your own life and about society. But even though you understand that, you still probably don't appreciate the full extent of the applicability of this model and how you can use it to solve many practical real world problems. So I want to devote an entire episode to helping you to see the potential of this model and just how useful it is and in how many different areas you can apply it, both in your personal life but also if you plan to go out into the world and have an impact on the world, which hopefully you want to have a positive impact on the world, whether you're pursuing your life purpose or you're starting a business or you're running for some government position or you're trying to change some social system, whether in your university or in your organization or doing some sort of charity work, all of this stuff would benefit enormously from you understanding spiral dynamics and from all the people in your organization understanding spiral dynamics. Remember, fundamentally, what is spiral dynamics about? It's explaining human beings' values and motives. That's extremely powerful. Think about that. What you're being given here is a scientific model that allows you to very accurately predict why human beings both individually and collectively, behave the way they behave and what they're going to do next. Think about how powerful that is. Think about what you can use that to do, how you can use that to transform the world for the better. Think about how you can use that to do your art, to do your business, to improve your studies. If you're a scientist or you're an academic or you're a researcher, to be able to know how these weird, irrational, complicated human beings, you know, we're, we're chaotic creatures. And usually when we think of human beings, we don't think of like having clear cut explanations for how human beings behave. And yet spiral dynamics gives us something like that. That's enormously powerful, especially when dealing with social issues. So let's now get into all the examples of the areas of application. So firstly, education. This is a huge area of application for spiral dynamics. And I put it as the first on my list because in some sense, it's perhaps the most important. It's one of those high leverage points that we have in society. If we transform our education system, and if we get our education system right, both at the elementary school level, the high school level, and the university level, if we, if we get that right, that will allow us to transform all the other problems we have in the world, because fundamentally all of our other problems stem from a lack of proper education. But of course, if you understand spiral dynamics, you know that education is not just one monolithic thing. Every stage of the spiral, every color has its own ideas and opinions and dogmas about what it feels is the best form of education, what education should look like. So if you ask a stage blue person, what should education look like? To them, it looks like religious indoctrination schools, the kind of stuff that you see in the Middle East, where you send your kid there and what they do is they, they beat him with a stick uh, and, and make him memorize the Quran every day for the next five years until he memorizes the whole Quran, right? That's their form of education there. That's a very hardcore, uh, deep blue stage approach to education. And I mean, we have a lot of religious education schools in America as well. So we're not immune to that. Not at all. I mean, Christians and evangelicals want basically that same kind of theocratic form of education here in the U.S. Um, that's stage blue. Then there's stage orange education, which is also a lot of what modern education is in America, for example. Stage orange being very kind of success oriented, and this is the kind of education where maybe you go to a trade school and they teach you some sort of specific trade skills 
And basically they train you so that you become good at business. They train you so you become good at a particular career. Uh, maybe you become a, a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, a computer programmer, some sort of physicist, scientist, whatever, right? It's just this sort of like straightforward rationalist form of education. And most people think that that, you know, that's like the pinnacle of education is stage orange education. But actually, this is a very, very um, limited form of education, which gets you chasing materialism because basically stage orange is a materialistic paradigm. So it gets you chasing materialism, chasing money, chasing business, chasing success. But in the end, this is all hollow and it leads to many of the other social problems that we have, environmental problems and so forth, because our education, a stage orange education, doesn't teach you about environmental factors, doesn't teach you about systems thinking, doesn't teach you about higher spiritual pursuits, doesn't teach you how to meditate, doesn't teach you about shamanism, doesn't teach you about self-actualization, all these topics that Actualize Zorik talks about, why wasn't it taught to you in your school? Because most people went to a stage orange school, which doesn't recognize these things, doesn't recognize the value of spirituality because it confuses spirituality with stage blue dogma or theocracy, which of course, you need to be at a higher stage of development in order to see the difference between those two. Um, uh, during the Bush administration, we passed legislation in the US called No Child Left Behind. And this was a, a tragic uh, legislation because what it did is, is it basically made most federal schools subject to very strict standards of like classroom testing. And so there's a lot of standardized testing. Kids these days are put through a ton of testing. I remember um, when I finished high school in 2003, um, already we had way too many standardized tests, but No Child Left Behind kicked in after that. I can only imagine how terrible it is now. Mostly what our education system is now, it's sort of like a factory farming approach to educating our children. The classroom sizes are very large. We're taught the exact same curriculum to all the children. There's no, um, there's no customization given to different types of students. There's no recognition, for example, that certain students need uh, one form of education while other students need another form of education, right? Certain students are more kinesthetic. Other students are more um, philosophical and abstract. Other students are more artistic and creative and artsy craftsy. Other students are more into like literature. Others are more into mathematics and computer programming. And you have to, you have to take into account, for example, that human beings have different brain types, which means that we're going to resonate with different kinds of subject matters. And right now our education system doesn't take any of this into account. It's just a very cookie cutter system. And it is all about like passing achievement scores. So it's like, can you read? Can you do math at a certain level? It's like, it's, it's very, very rudimentary. And mostly we're training kids how to pass tests, how to get good at answering multiple choices and, and guess the right answers rather than actually educating them for like deep understanding of what reality is and what life is and how life works. And that's exactly what you would expect with a very mechanical sort of materialistic approach of stage orange. But this is, um, this is problematic because later in life, what this leads to is this leads to a very materialistic form of living where the student can't really be connected to life, can't really be passionate about things because they weren't taught how to be passionate. They weren't taught how to find their life purpose. They weren't taught the importance of life purpose. They weren't taught the importance of, uh, of meditation. They weren't taught the importance of holistic health because stage orange doesn't understand these things yet. So then you get the stage green education, which is one step better. And, uh, and here they might start teaching you a little bit more about health, a little bit more about sex and love and relationships and a little bit more about the environment and a little bit more about ecology and this sorts of stuff. And this is mostly um, what a lot of universities teach these days. Mm. And even so, there's still a big backlash right now happening um, from various folks against stage green universities because they want them to be more stage orange rather than green. And this is the whole Jordan uh, Peterson shtick that he's all about is he thinks the universities are too green, which of course is, is, is the opposite of the problem. Um, yes, universities are green, but the solution is not to drag them back down to orange and blue, but to evolve them up to yellow. 
So what would a stage yellow approach to education look like? It would acknowledge for the first time that different students in different parts of the world and in different parts of the country are all at their own levels of the spiral. So maybe, for example, what would happen is you enter a university and they would give you a test. But this wouldn't be a test for you to, to do some multiple choice, you know, passing some sort of um, government standards. This would be a test to determine where you are at the spiral. And then whether you're blue or orange or green or yellow or whatever, and then they would recommend a curriculum that's going to be right for you. Let's say you're at stage blue. If you're at stage blue and you enter university, then you go into the stage blue program. The stage blue program is not just going to feed you stage blue propaganda. The stage blue program is going to be designed in such a way that it evolves you up to orange and then from orange to green and above. If you're a student who enters at stage orange, there's going to be a separate track for you, which helps to evolve you into stage green. And if you're a student who enters at green, there's going to be a separate track for you that evolves you to yellow. So this would be a tier two approach to education. This would be um, an understanding of the entire spiral, seeing that education needs to be different for every stage of the spiral. Different ideas need to be taught. Different techniques need to be used. Um, and if you're designing education from a stage or uh, yellow perspective, then you're designing it such that you're helping everybody evolve up the spiral at their own pace. You see, part of the problem with stage green education is that they try to push stage green on everybody below them. And that tends to not work and actually creates that sort of Jordan Peterson uh, ego backlash reaction, um, which is what you're seeing when stage blue and orange encounter stage green, they tend to uh, not want to evolve up to green. That's because green isn't properly explaining the situation to them. It's not properly designed yet. Stage, or, stage yellow could be much better at doing that. Also, if we're talking about education all over the world, it's very important that when we're talking about underdeveloped countries, like in the Middle East, in Africa, in South America, and other places, that you, you need to take into account their level of the spiral. And a lot of those countries, their people are at stage purple, or red, or blue like very, very low on the spiral. And so we need to tailor the education programs to work for those stages of the spiral. A common mistake is that educators from the US who are mostly a stage green will try to go to Africa and teach stage green ideas to maybe some ki kids in rural Africa uh, who are at like stage purple. And it just, it, it's a complete disconnect not going to work. You can also think about if you're a teacher within education, if you're a professor or a high school teacher, or even an elementary school teacher, you can think about how you might expose your students to spiral dynamics. That would be a stage yellow approach. You can also think about how to make yourself a better teacher by learning spiral dynamics and also tailoring your own curriculum to different students, even if you don't make them take various kinds of assessments to officially d discover what color of the stage they're at, you can still use Spiral Dynamics as a model just to help you get a little sense of like, well, that kid is maybe stage blue, his parents are very blue, that kid's very green, that kid's very orange, and um, you're not doing this to judge them or to pigeonhole them, but you're doing this in your own mind to help you understand what does that student need to evolve up to the next level and how can I help him to evolve up to the next level? So, for example, you can do this as an elementary school teacher starting with first grade. You don't even need to tell the, the kids that you're teaching about spiral dynamics. All of that can be just happening under the surface. You know that you, you're using this model, but they won't know. But the way in which you're teaching, the way in which you're communicating to them, the way in which you're explaining something to some kid who doesn't understand is informed by your understanding of spiral dynamics. And, of course, the same thing within university. Um, and of course, by understanding that, the higher you are up the spiral, the better you will be able to deal with 
kids and students that are lower on the spiral than you. So right now, if you're a stage green teacher, you probably struggle teaching stage blue students. Whereas if you were at stage yellow, you evolved yourself up to yellow and you understood the spiral more, then you could deal more effectively with stage blue students and really any students on the spiral. So there's a lot that can be applied to education and I'm really just scratching the tip of the iceberg. If you're really serious about transforming our education system, uh, if you're serious about being a great teacher, if you're seeing, serious about running a great university, Spiral Dynamics is absolutely essential for you to understand. And if you're a government official who intends to pass legislation to improve education throughout the country, it's even more important. Because part of the problem is that the legislation that's being passed is always being passed at whatever stage of the spiral the politician is at. And because most of our politicians are stage blue or orange, a little bit of green, but not really much beyond that, they tend to pass that kind of legislation. So they tend to look at our education system in the US, for example, and tend to come up with solutions which are not really effective at educating people. It's more about putting them through tests or putting them into various religious uh, indoctrination programs or, you know, stuff like that without really getting to the heart of what is necessary to educate people. And the only way you're going to really understand that is by ascending to stage yellow and, and above. For example, if you really want to transform education system, and this will happen in the next couple hundred years, is we would start teaching children from first grade about meditation, mindfulness, yoga, holistic health, uh, enlightenment, non-duality, spirituality, not religion, but spirituality, and other personal development topics that I talk about with Actualize.org. Basically, if we took the entire Actualize.org curriculum and we started teaching that from first grade all the way through 12th grade, we de-emphasized subjects like history, mathematics, and uh, whatever else they teach. These subjects are important. We still need to teach them, but they are not nearly as important for living a good life as the subject that I just earlier mentioned earlier. And so really what we need to do is we need to radically change our system such that we're not teaching kids some standardized curriculum of math, English, and history, which is mostly what uh, the first 12 grades are, but we're rather teaching them wisdom we're teaching them how to be good human beings. We're teaching them how to be conscious of their body and their mind. We're teaching them how to understand ideology, epistemology, metaphysics, these very fundamental topics, so that when a student graduates 10th grade, he has fully mastered everything that I talk about with Actualize.org, all of the topics that are necessary for finding your life purpose, for living a passionate life, for dealing with emotional issues like depression, or suicidal thoughts, or ego backlashes, or fear and anger and anxiety and addiction. Like Students will know how to solve all those problems on their own by the time they graduate 12th grade. And then if they need mathematics and history and, and science and those, this kind of stuff, they can get that in higher education. If they really, you know, if they really want to become scientists and mathematicians, professionally speaking. But most people are not going to be professional mathematicians or scientists, so they don't need that much technical training. You don't need 12 years of mathematics for the average person. It's complete waste. It's overkill. What the average person needs is uh, an understanding of practical psychology. They need an understanding of how to manage their relationships consciously. They need an understanding of what happiness is and what are the proper ways of pursuing happiness, and what are the improper ways of pursuing happiness. They need some spiritual techniques, some very practical techniques like various kinds of meditation or self-inquiry or yoga that they can just like do for the rest of their life that they were taught when they were young so that they can rely on those techniques to further build their level of consciousness. So just imagine what a world would look like if we had that kind of education system in place right now. That would be a very different world. That would change everything. That would trickle down into all the other areas 
in society that we have problems in. Mm. This would eliminate the drug problem, eliminate the opioid problem, eliminate the gun problem, eliminate political corruption problems, eliminate economic problems, eliminate people who hate their careers because they weren't taught how to find a good career. Um, eliminate poverty issues, eliminate business corruption issues, uh, reduce stress on the on the prison system and the legal justice system, right? Because all of these other problems basically stem from a lack of proper training and education. But uh, it'll take us hundreds of years to evolve up to that kind of level of education. There is enormous resistance and inertia within the education system because the ego knows that if the education system was properly reformed, then all of the ego's games would be up. See? So of course, stage blue and stage orange and stage green are gonna fight like hell to make sure that a stage yellow education system is never put in place. Because that's what every stage in tier one basically does. It thinks it's the best, it thinks it knows best, and it wants to teach everybody its own stage, and it wants to demonize all the other stages. It's only a stage yellow that you transcend that. So that was just education. What about healthcare and medicine? Right now, in the United States, we have a terrible stage orange healthcare and medicine system, where healthcare and medicine is done mostly for profit, the way healthcare and medicine is taught in universities is also in a very mechanical, materialistic fashion, such that a lot of holistic healing modalities are ignored. The spiritual and psychological aspects of health are completely ignored. Your insurance company, for example, won't even pay for life coaching or for certain kinds of therapies, uh, for psychotherapy, for other kinds of uh, what we might call new age healing modalities, which are very, very effective, like perhaps like acupuncture, or chiropractor services, or even more weird services, like um, various kinds of psychic healings that you can get and stuff like that. Like none of that is covered by the mainstream healthcare and medicine system because it's not recognized as being legitimate or valid because stage orange is very materialistic. And so our healthcare system is just like our education system where it's basically like factory farming where uh, you just uh, kind of put a sick human being through the system. You send him to a doctor. The doctor goes through the checklist of, of you know, what he was taught to go through. And then he prescribes pills and medications because that's all he's been told to prescribe. That's what he's been indoctrinated with in, in his medical training is that, hey, if a person has this problem, then you just prescribe this pill. And of course, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is, is making sure that that system stays that way because they, they bribe the education system and they, they bribe all the doctors um, uh, with good paychecks and good bonuses and incentives just to keep prescribing the medication. And then of course, what kind of medicine and healthcare is advertised all over the TV? It's materialistic medicine, which doesn't address any of the root issues. It just is like a Band-Aid on a wound. So very few healthcare professionals in the U.S., whether they're surgeons, doctors, uh, people who are trying to help you to lose weight, or even uh, mental healthcare professionals like psychotherapists, almost none of them have a deep understanding of what human illness stems from, from the incorrect psychology. None of them have a spiritual dimension to healthcare and to medicine which is one of the most important dimensions. They just try to quickly treat a surface symptom rather than helping you to address the root cause. And oftentimes this only makes the problem worse, not better. So what might a stage green or a stage yellow healthcare system look like? Very different. Uh, First of all, it wouldn't be done so much for profit. There would be a lot better ethics in the healthcare and medicine system. Also, it would open itself up to new modalities, um, the new age modalities. 
modalities that are not as hard nosed scientific as uh, we insist on right now. It would open up to modalities from shamanism and from other parts of the world. We would look, for example, at how do how do they do healthcare in Japan? How do they do healthcare in South America? How do the shamans do healthcare in little tribal villages? How do they um, how do they stay thin in tribal cultures? They don't have an obesity problem in many cases. How do they do that? You know, so we we would look at all this stuff. How do we use herbs and other kind of natural supplements? Not just pills, but you know, a lot of supplements are more effective than pills. But of course, this is not recognized by many doctors and by the big pharma industry. Uh, we might also start to think very differently about psychedelics. How can we use psychedelics as medicine? And right now, there's some really good research that's happening in the last 10 years where they will probably soon be legalizing things like mushrooms and MDMA and LSD for... Um, for clinical therapeutic uses, because they're so effective at treating depression, they're effective at treating PTSD, they're effective at uh, helping people cope with uh, with um, end of life problems and and so many other things. You know, so this is this is all starting to it's 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 starting to come on board, but it's still we're like really in the early phases. And so, if you're a doctor and you're passionate about healing people. And hell, you know, if you have been passionate about being a doctor, that's why, ultimately, you didn't become a doctor to enter some kind of bureaucratic hospital system or the health insurance industry. You became a doctor because you wanted to heal people. So that's what you got to focus on as a doctor. And then your, your question should be, well, if I want to heal people, what are all the, the most effective ways at healing people? Let me go and explore and research all the different modalities that are available all around the world. Um, throughout all of human history, find the best ones, experiment with them myself, and really be able to help heal people. Not just heal them physically, but also help heal them psychologically, help heal them spiritually, recognizing that there's um, a deep connection between our physical ailments, our psychological illnesses, and our spiritual disconnection from the truth. And so, by taking this more holistic approach, incorporating all of these elements together, that's how you can really become an amazing healer. But then, of course, you got to ask yourself, but there's this giant bureaucracy of the insurance industry and the hospital system and all of this, the education system for medicine. How do we transform those systems such that they acknowledge all of these multiple dimensions of health? That's going to take a lot of work. But, you know, if you're serious about being a good healer, then that's your job, is to figure out solutions to those problems and to help to reform these systems and to advance us to the next stage of healthcare and medicine, from orange to green and then from green to yellow and beyond. And you see, that means going way beyond your traditional training. So if you did eight years of medical school or 10 years or whatever it is, um, that's just really the beginning. Now you need to do another 10 years into holistic health. And then you also got to experiment with yourself and see how this stuff works on you. So it's not just about running clinical studies on rats and monkeys in, in a cage. You got to also understand that for you as a healthcare provider, to be a good healer, you need to yourself go on a spiritual journey to heal yourself. Mentally, physically, psychologically, spiritually. Um, and only then will you able to really be, will you really be able to help others. So, so you can see just by understanding spiral dynamics, you start to see that someone who wants to be a healer or a doctor who understands spiral dynamics is going to be a totally different healer or doctor than someone who doesn't, who just goes through the motions of going through the standard bureaucratic system. You see, these are going to be two very different doctors. And this one is going to be 10 times more effective at healing people than this one is. The next area of application is helping underdeveloped countries like the Middle East and Africa. There are a lot of countries in the world which have all sorts of problems. Problems with infrastructure, problems with disease, problems with poverty, problems with um, AIDS, 
problems with um, their political systems, problems with genocide and ethnic cleansing and warfare, uh, problems with just not enough clean water, you know. Um, and there are a lot of nonprofit and charity organizations, organizations in the U.S. and in developed countries that are trying to help raise the Middle East and help to raise Africa. For example, uh, uh, the Bill Gates Foundation is helping uh, in Africa with various vaccines and so forth. And there's many of these kinds of foundations. The problem, though, is that unless they take a spiral approach to addressing these problems, then you can pour billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars into these countries without getting much return on your investment. And especially when we're talking about dealing with the various political problems that exist in these societies, what we're talking about is political problems that stem from a low level of development on the spiral. So um, perhaps the most obvious recent example of, of this sort of blunder of not approaching underdeveloped countries from a spiral perspective is what happens in the Middle East. So the United States decides to invade Iraq, thinking that by invading Iraq, we're going to liberate the Iraqi people from Saddam Hussein, this terrible dictator. Except what's not understood is that Iraq is at a stage purple, stage red level of spiral development, which means that you cannot install democracy in Iraq just by deposing Saddam Hussein. Because in a stage red society, what's going to happen is that you install democracy, but the people there are not at a level of development where they can where they can buy into democracy. See, the majority of Iraqis are like a stage red, maybe even lower. So what they need is they need a strong leader. And that's what Saddam Hussein was. Was he, uh, was he violent and bloodthirsty? Of course he was. That's part of what it takes to be a successful leader at stage red. Because he has other people there who are going to overpower him if he's not like that. So what a lot of uh, people in de democratic countries naively assume is that, hey, all we got to do is we just got to like depose the dictators and we just got to like distribute democracy and it's all, it's all just going to work out. No, it won't. Because first what you need to do is you need to raise the level of development and consciousness of the entire population, including all the poor and sick people, all the business people, all the religious clerics and leaders. You'd have to transform all of that, which is going to take you hundreds of years of of education and and, uh, and work to do that, you need to build up various kinds of social and political infrastructure which don't exist there. For example, various kinds of judicial systems, legal systems. You need a constitution. You need like all these things need to be put into place. You need to install secularism first, because after stage red comes stage blue. Stage blue is theocracy. So if you give a democracy to uh, a stage red slash blue Middle Eastern country, what's going to happen is they're going to create a theocracy out of that. And then the religious mi majority there, who's going to be running the theocracy, is going to persecute and ethnically cleanse the religious minorities. Because stage blue doesn't acknowledge yet the validity of minority opinions and perspectives. That only comes at stage orange and above, and really at stage green. See, so if our, you know, if our military leaders and political thinkers understood spiral dynamics, they would have a very different approach to all sorts of geopolitical issues around the world. Also, of course, if they weren't just coming from a stage orange perspective where they were doing all of this out of personal greed and personal gain by benefiting the military industrial complex and so forth, um, you know, if, if they themselves were leading from a stage yellow perspective where they were actually trying to help these countries and not just to exploit them for oil or to exploit them for various kinds of military contracts and so forth, that would be a very different way to run the government. And of course, the problem is, is that the United States leadership is not at stage yellow yet. So the reason we're fucking up in the Middle East is because we ourselves are not developed enough yet. So the irony is that even though we as the United States like to criticize the Middle East for being so underdeveloped, 
we ourselves are not developed enough yet in order to really be able to help the Middle East properly. And uh, if you think about problems like um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, everything I've been saying applies to that problem as well. If you really want to solve that problem, what you need to do is take a spiral approach. And that's actually exactly what Don Beck has done. Don Beck was one of the developers of Spiral Dynamics. He actually has spent years in the Middle East working specifically on applying Spiral Dynamics to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And um, it's really illuminating to, to read about his work and his efforts in doing that and how much success he's had in doing that. Of course, not total success because the problem there is, is very complicated. And part of the problem is that the U.S. leadership isn't acknowledging spiral dynamics, isn't really applying spiral dynamics to, um, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because there's, uh, there's various kinds of self-interest and self-dealing going on there. Um, they're not really taking an objective approach to the situation. But if you really wanted to take an objective approach and to resolve that situation, then you would study spiral dynamics and you would follow the work of Don Beck and kind of take what he's been doing and then just amplify that up. The problem is that it's difficult for him to get enough funding in order to really do his work there and to have a big impact. Um, but I'll actually post a, a book on my book list in the future, which explains all of the uh, intricacies of how he was applying spiral dynamics in the Middle East to help resolve that particular problem. And what that ultimately involves, just in a nutshell, because it's very complicated, but in a nutshell, what it involves is you have to recognize that in the Middle East, uh, with the Palestinians and the Israelis, Israeli society has multiple strata of people at different development levels. So you've got Israelis at blue, you've got Israelis at orange, you've got Israelis at green. The Palestinians are less developed. And you've got Palestinians at red, you've got Palestinians even at purple, you've got Palestinians at blue, you've got Palestinians at orange, and you've got some Palestinians at green. And so what needs to happen is you've got to teach spiral dynamics to all these different stages and help them to understand that that this problem in, in Israel and Palestine, it's not just about yes Israel or no Palestine or vice versa. It's not just a simple kind of black and white, good versus bad, who's going to win, us or them. Um, that can't possibly be resolved. What needs to be understood is that society is complex. Both of these uh, societies are very complex and that there's different kinds of forces and motivations and value systems at work which are making it very difficult to reconcile what's going on there. Because what's happening is at the lower stages, those segments of society which are at purple or red or blue, what they're doing is they're radicalizing the uh, political discussion and they're radicalizing the higher stages like orange and green and uh, making everybody kind of ultra-nationalistic and fighting only for their side and unwilling to see that they need to come together and to understand that there's kind of a spiral at work and that really there's more common factors between the Palestinians and Israelis than just their religious differences or their geopolitical uh, self-interests, but it's really, they're, they're both evolving up the spiral, but just at, at, at different rates and in different ways. And uh, if they understood that better, then this situation could be resolved. But uh, the problem, of course, is that for every one person who's trying to explain the spiral to people, and by explaining the spiral, that helps to de-radicalize people, there's a hundred others who are themselves radicals and ideologues who are trying to do the exact opposite thing, which is they're trying to radicalize people and polarize them for their side. And so what we need is we need more people teaching spiral dynamics in a non-judgmental, um, non-condemning sort of way, and uh, that leads to depolarization and ultimately de-escalation. Because before you can get political violence, first what needs to happen is you need to ideologically radicalize people. And usually the ones who get ideologically rad radicalized are the poorest, the ones who are the lowest on the spiral, the ones who have the least to lose. Because, you know, if you're living in the Middle East and you've lost your family to some drone strike, and you don't have any good job prospects, and the, mm, the economy is doing bad, um, and then you're listening to your religious cleric who's a radical, who's radicalizing you about uh, 
you know, how evil the other side is who has caused all these problems for you, scapegoating some other group of people, then what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to just, uh, you're going to accept that as a dogma, as an ideology. You're going to get radicalized and polarized. And then you're going to go and you're going to commit violence. Also understanding, for example, that if we want to solve terrorism in the Middle East, that's not going to happen through military combat. A much better approach would be through funding education programs, uh, funding healthcare, uh, genuinely helping their economy, not just trying to leech off their oil supplies, but actually helping their economy get off its feet or get on its feet, rather. Um, through these kinds of efforts, by actually improving the quality of their society, by helping to meet their basic needs, that's going to help to evolve them up the spiral. And in this way, people will stop wanting to be terrorists. They're only terrorists, really, because their society is at such a low level of development. It has nothing to do with Islam, per se. It has nothing to do with, um, with religion. Um, and that's another very uh, useful thing that spiral dynamics will show you if you really study this model. Because a lot of people... Even in the U.S., there's a lot of intelligent people here who tend to blame Islam or to blame religion for the problems that are happening in the Middle East, when really that's not what the issue is. The issue is their level of spiral development. When you understand the spiral and all the stages, then you understand that Islam can exist at stage red, which is a very violent, power-hungry version. It can exist at stage blue, which is a little bit more peaceful, but still very dominant and theocratic. It can exist at stage orange which will be very materialistic and business oriented. It could exist at stage green. It could even exist at yellow and even at turquoise. But see, most people, they think of Islam as just one monolithic thing. And then they have an opinion about it, like, oh, it's bad or, oh, it's good. Without having a more nuanced understanding of like, no, there's different levels of Islam. Certain levels of Islam are very regressive and uh, repressive. And other levels of Islam can be very advanced and uh, very beneficial. So what the Middle East needs is not to eradicate Islam. In fact, if you try to do that, you're actually just going to provoke an ego backlash from the Middle East. And they're going to hate you because you're taking away something that's so, so uh, cherished by them. It would be like taking away your business or taking away your constitution or taking away your gun rights. Right? You, you, don't, you don't like that as an American if we try to do that. So that's the same thing as like you're trying to take away Islam from some Middle Eastern person. Um, it's going to backfire on you. Instead, a much smarter approach would be to understand that no, there's, there's healthy forms of Islam. Let's help to evolve them and to see the differences between the unhealthy versions and the healthy versions. And then, um, you know, once we get them to that level, then they will be ready to, to move to more secular worldviews. And then... Beyond that, there will be even higher, more spiritual worldviews. But of course, to take that approach, we ourselves as Americans would have to be evolved enough to be able to understand that there's, there's validity within all the different religious traditions. We can't just dismiss them all as uh, childish nonsense because there is something valuable within these religious traditions. And that's why people cling to them so adamantly because there is something of value there, which means that you can't just throw them away because you'd be throwing the baby away with the bathwater, and they're not going to let you do that. See? But good luck explaining that to an atheist. Because the stage orange atheist won't understand that. Because to him, his worldview says that all religion is just childish nonsense, and there's no validity to it whatsoever. It's completely unscientific, and it's just mythology and just complete uh, superstition and gibberish. So if you take that approach, then you're never going to really be able to resolve the Middle East issues. You're going to turn into some sort of Sam Harris type of person who just points his finger at Middle Easterners um, without really contributing um, to, a, a, to kind of like a broadening of perspective and helping us understand each other. So a lot of these problems that happen around the world, geopolitical problems, are simply due to lack of understanding each other, lack of seeing through other people's eyes, lack of being able to take higher and higher perspectives. And that's all that spiral dynamics is basically about, is about how to take higher and higher perspectives. That's what moves you up the spiral. 
So by being able to take more perspectives yourself, you will be less judgmental and you will be able to help other people take more perspectives as well, which will help to reduce violence and misunderstanding and animosity and racism and hatred and genocide and all that kind of stuff that we don't like. But it starts with you. You got to sort that out first for yourself. Then you can help others. Otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to turn into a devil yourself and you're going to be polarizing people against other people. Which is exactly what someone like Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson does is what, and why I'm so critical of them is because they're contributing to polarization. But of course, um, I also understand that they can't help it. It's just happening out of ignorance. The level of development that they're at, they can't do better. In the same way that a terrorist, the level of development a terrorist is at, he can't do any better. That's how ignorance works. So, uh, so on the one hand, I can criticize them, but, but also on the other hand, I understand why they're at where they're at and why they're having the ego reaction that they're having. See? So it's that kind of understanding that you only get a stage yellow and above. Also, another area of application is with economics. Economics is a super important field. I actually have a whole book that I'm reading uh, about spiral dynamics and economics, how to take a spiral approach, stage yellow approach to economics. Right now, especially in the US and basically all around the world, our economic system is stage orange. It's very capitalistic. It's all about maximizing profits. That's, uh, that's mostly what Wall Street's doing. That's what the stock markets are doing all around the world. That's what most corporations are doing. Uh -huh. They're just spreading themselves like a cancer. These corporations have no ecological awareness. They don't recognize uh, workers' rights. They don't recognize the importance of unions. They don't recognize uh, mm -hmm. the damage that their marketing and advertising has on the world. They're just going purely for maximum profits. That's what Big Pharma is doing. That's what Big Oil is doing. That's what the fast food industry is doing. That's what the entire food in industry basically is doing. That's what, uh, I mean, uh, most businesses, a lot of the, um, a lot of the Silicon Valley tech businesses are also falling into this trap right now. Facebook, Apple, Google, uh, these companies, especially Google, for example, is a bit more of a stage green company, but still a lot of stage orange is running the show. And that's why you see all these legal battles between these big companies over patents and all, all sorts of stuff. So we have a very, very stage orange economic system. And there's an enormous resistance right now to stage green economic systems, which would look more socialistic, which doesn't necessarily mean socialism. I just mean they look more socialistic. They have more socialist elements in them. They are more concerned about equal distribution of... Uh, of resources, uh, more progressive taxation scales, and uh, holding corporations more to account, um, higher wages for employees, uh, more say that employees have in how the organization is run so that these, these uh, organizations and corporations are not functioning like, like dictatorships, which a lot of them are, where the boss at the top tells all the employees what to do, but it's more of a cooperative corporation where the employees have more of a stake, they have more of a say, there's sort of a representative corporate board and all of that. And the corporation is not just pursuing maximum value, but the corporation is conscious about its impact on the economy, on the ecology, on the environment, on government, like all this sorts of stuff, right? This would be a huge step up if we can get our economic system up from orange to green. And that's sort of the battle that you're seeing right now between um, many progressives who want a more socialistic economic system and then those who are sort of the diehard capitalists and libertarians and conservatives who are dead set against that ideologically. And so that's being hashed out right now in our political system in America. Very interesting to see how this works. But there's even higher perspectives on economics than just the green one that I was just explaining. There's also... Stage yellow, for example. And what does yellow economics look like? 
well, that's a very technical subject. I'm reading a whole book on that. I'll post that book on my book list when I'm finished reading it. So you can read about that yourself. But, um, but just realize that again, most people, when they think about economics, for example, they have a very static one stage view of economics. They think of economics as like, well, capitalism is good. Socialism is evil or vice versa. Socialism is good. Capitalism is, capitalism is evil without recognizing that. No, there's, there's various stages. There's like stage blue, orange, green, and then above green. And that it's not about just imposing socialism on everybody or imposing capitalism on everybody. It's about finding the nuances in between and finding, you know, what's the right mix of various capitalistic and socialistic policies and systems and structures such that we maximize what? What are we maximizing? Well, that depends what stage you're at. If you're at stage orange, you're maximizing money. So of course you want capitalism. Uh, at stage green, you're trying to maximize relationships and fairness and equality. So of course you're gonna lean more socialistic. And at stage, uh, at stage yellow, you're gonna be trying to help everybody move up the spiral. So you're gonna take a very nuanced perspective, a very kind of systems thinking perspective about how do we engineer our economic systems to make sure that we're not just having equality, and we're not just helping to eliminate poverty, but we're helping to evolve everyone up the spiral. What kind of econ economic system would we need then? See? So um, that's, um, that's a very fertile ground to mine. Speaking of government and politics, Spiral Dynamics is very helpful for evaluating political candidates who are running for office, for evaluating political parties, and for understanding the culture wars. Almost all political conflicts, especially those we've been seeing in the United States recently and in Europe, are perfectly explained by spiral dynamics. In the US, it's basically stage blue slash orange fighting against stage green slash orange. Um, and uh, spiral dynamics, for example, for me has been very helpful in being able to evaluate political candidates. So. When I see somebody running for office, I just ask myself, well, what stage of the spiral are they at? Which stage of the spiral are they trying to enable? How ideological and dogmatic are they about what stage they're at? And that helps me to evaluate how good of a candidate this would be. Basically, the best candidate is the one who's highest up the spiral. Ideally, we'd have stage yellow candidates, but there are so few of those to go around these days. Stage green is... is um, often the best you can get. And even that, most people oppose vehemently because it's, it's too high above their own current level. The way that government and politics works is that voters generally only vote for their own stage. They're not smart enough to, to, to vote for a stage above the one that they're at. So if you're at stage blue, that's who you're gonna vote for. If you're stage orange, you think the perfect political candidate is the most orange guy. If you're a stage green, you're going to want uh, the most green Bernie Sanders type of candidate that there is. Uh, so in a sense, you're very unimaginative and you're very, very predictable with your political choices. Whereas if you're at stage yellow, you'll be a little bit more nuanced. But also there probably won't be very many candidates that you'll like. So uh, Spiral Dynamics is useful for that. It's useful for evaluating political parties, for example. If you don't know spiral dynamics, then you might be tempted to do a false equivalency between the Republican Party in the US and the Democratic Party. But if you understand spiral dynamics, then you understand that actually the Democratic Party, they're not just two sides of the same coin. The Democratic Party is more cognitively and spiritually evolved than the Republican Party. That's just a fact that you will understand if you understand spiral dynamics. Now, you might not like that fact if you're in the Republican Party. Of course you won't. And that's precisely why you won't want to spiral, study spiral dynamics in this case. Um, but you know, if you're open-minded and you really care about the truth and you care about really understanding what's going on, then you will be able to see that even though the Democratic Party has many problems, it's certainly not perfect. Um, it is certainly superior than the Republican Party right now. Now, that doesn't mean it's always gonna be this way. You know, in the next 100 years, that might change. Political parties are always changing. Um, but uh, but see, without spiral dynamics, you might be tempted to, th to think that like, well, but you know, Republican or Democrat, they're kind of similar or they're just like two opposite poles. 
but they're not two opposite poles. There's a spiral and there's the Democrats, but then the Democrats can evolve higher up the spiral as well. So the Democrats are not like the end point. There's higher to go above the Democrats. And the Democrats have a lot of work to do because they're really not that evolved. But the Republicans are less evolved. And that's important to recognize. That's important to know. See, no one on TV, no one who's doing political analysis will tell you this. Part of the reason why is because it's, it's, uh, it's very controversial. You know, good luck uh, getting a, a CNN anchor like Wolf Blitzer, for example, to tell you that, um, that liberals are cognitively more developed than conservatives. You know, that would be extremely, uh, a extremely polarizing and radical position. And if he said that, he would be called a liberal. But that's not a liberal position. That's just something that's coming from a, a deeper understanding of spiral dynamics. The culture wars, if you're trying to understand what those are about, that's all about um, spiral dynamics. Stages fighting against each other. And it's very unproductive. It's a huge waste of time. The culture wars distract us from actually doing good government, actually improving the systems that are creating the results for people. So by understanding the spiral, you're going to see that this, the culture wars are just different stages judging each other. And um, the sooner we can transcend that, the, the quicker we can improve our government and the better off most of us will be. There's all sorts of other governmental problems that we face, like prison reform, environmental problems, civil rights issues, poverty, racism, terrorism, crime, the drug war, immigration issues. All of these issues are made so much clearer if you understand spiral dynamics. The solutions to all of these problems will really only come at stage green or yellow. They will not come at the current stage that we're at, which is mostly blue and orange approaches to many of these problems. For example, when we're talking about the environment, the destruction, pollution of the environment and global warming, these are very serious concerns that many people are starting to catch on to now, but still we're struggling as a society, we're struggling to really get leverage and to really start to take action on these environmental problems. Why is that? Well, if you understood spiral dynamics, you would understand that's because in order to care about the environment and to take ecological issues seriously, a person has to be at stage green or above. At stage blue, the person is too preoccupied with their dogmas and their religious traditions to care about any kind of emerging ecological crises because those weren't present in their traditions. So, of course, to them, it, it's just a fantasy. And to stage orange people, they're too preoccupied with their own self-interested uh, gaining of success, pursuing personal achievement and money and business success that they don't have time to worry about ecological problems. They don't care about looking at how their strive for achievement and business success is actually causing massive economic, uh, ecological problems. They don't care about that because, hey, me first, I gotta take care of myself first before I worry about the environment, before I worry about the animals, before I worry about other people's kids drinking mm, polluted water, or before I worry about some sort of rising sea levels, like to them, <laughs> that doesn't compute because at stage orange, all I care about is just advancing me and my family financially. So by understanding this, we can go and we can, we can reconfigure our education system such that our education system helps to move people up to stage green. And then once they're at green, they'll be much more environmentally conscious. And then we can actually start to take action on the environment. See? then those stage green people can vote in stage green politicians who will then also actually care about the environment because most of the politicians we have right now, they're stage orange or below. So they don't care about the environment. As long as some corporation pays the money, they'll look the other way. But if they were at stage green, they would be too conscious and too developed to be able to just look the other way. So all these issues, drug war, immigration, the solutions are really stage green and stage orange, uh, stage yellow solutions. 
And many of the solutions that are being proposed right now are stage order solutions, which just won't work. They're unsustainable. Or even worse, stage blue solutions, which are regressive. And, uh, and then there's a lot of bickering back and forth. And, you know, when you're listening to political commentary on the news or reading it online somewhere, never are the real solutions discussed to these issues. Never is the real solution to racism or poverty or healthcare or terrorism or crime or the drug war or immigration or the environment ever discussed. What's discussed is just the surface level uh, cultural war bickering back and forth, <clears throat> the judgments that each side throws at itself or at the other side. Um, a stage yellow approach is never taken. A stage yellow approach would focus on the solutions to these problems. Solutions that are grounded in, in empirical data, in facts, in science, in various research, in actual testing and trial and error. That's what we really need. We need a more scientific approach to our government rather than sort of this knee-jerk ideological approach, which uh, we've been taking for a long time. In the area of <clears throat> psychotherapy, coaching, and consulting, spiral dynamics can be very effective. Most coaches and consultants and psychotherapists don't know spiral dynamics. So when they give their advice or they try to guide people, or guide companies to get certain kinds of results, how helpful would it be if you understood where your client is at? Like if you're a therapist or a coach or a consultant, to understand that, okay, this CEO who I'm coaching, he's at stage orange and he's stuck at orange and he's dealing with all the orange limitations and fears and problems that exist. And you as the coach could be able to, to point those out to him and to, to show him why he's resisting moving up to stage green and help him to make a transition up into green to see that green is not as bad and as evil as he's always portrayed it in his mind. Or that you could see that this client here that you have is, is steep in stage orange or sorry, in stage green. You have a very stage green type, type of hippie client, but you can see as your, as, as his coach, you can see that this client's problem is that he jumped to stage green way too early and he didn't master stage orange yet. So he has, uh, maybe he's very spiritual and he's into yoga and all this sorts of stuff, but he hasn't really mastered his livelihood. So he, he has trouble keeping a job and paying the bills. And so you can help to point out to him that, hey, yeah, you're a green and that's great, but you've got more stuff at orange that you haven't fully integrated. Let me help you into, to see those elements of orange that you've been demonizing and denying. Help yourself to integrate those and then we can move you up even beyond green to yellow. Or if you've got a client that's at yellow, you could help to share with him various kinds of um, maybe spiritual techniques and spiritual insights and more advanced kind of non-dual teachings that will help him to evolve up to turquoise. How helpful would that be? That would completely transform your coaching practice, your therapeutic practice. And if you're a therapist who's dealing with all sorts of very dysfunctional people, <clears throat> um, you might get a person into your, <clears throat> into your office who's like regressed to stage red, you know, very, very sort of primitive, um, narcissistic, self-centered sorts of motivations and values. And you as a therapist are probably at stage green yourself. So if you're at stage green and you're trying to teach stage green teachings to a stage red person, that's going to create such a huge disconnect for you that your therapy will not be effective. And in fact, you'll burn out because you'll be wondering, why do, why do all my stage green techniques not work on this stage red person? Well, because they're not there yet. And you as the coach or the therapist could also tailor your communication style to whatever level your client is at. So this does not mean that you need to give your client a formal test. When you really understand this model, you'll be able to just like look at people, talk to them for five or 10 minutes and get a really good idea of where they're at, especially in a therapeutic or coaching setting where people can be very honest about their 
motivations and values, you can get a very quick understanding of what's driving the person. And then once you understand that, to help to move them up the spiral, you can now communicate to them in a way that fits with their value system. So for example, if I was coaching a stage orange client who's very business oriented, and I wanted to explain to him <clears throat> the benefits of stage green, I wouldn't be talking to him about how, oh, but if you change your business to a more stage green business, then you're gonna help save the, the polar bears. He doesn't give a fuck about polar bears. All right, and I understand that. So what I can do is I can I can dumb down my communication a little bit and I can say, look, <clears throat> don't build a more green business for the polar bears. Build a more green business because in five years, you yourself will evolve to stage green. If right now you're gonna invest all this time and money building a stage orange business, imagine what's gonna happen once you yourself evolve up to stage green. You're gonna have to abandon your business because all of your managers and all of your people are gonna be stage orange and they're all gonna be money hungry, chasing sex and fast cars and success. And you, by that point, will be into psychedelics and spirituality and yoga and all this sorts of stuff. And your business is gonna be much lower and it's gonna be dragging you down. So for your own personal development, which is what Sage Orange cares about, for your own personal development as the CEO of this orange company, start thinking about how to transition your company already into green so you don't hold yourself back. And also, I would challenge you that you can make more money building a green business than an orange business. And see, to a stage orange person, now that resonates because he's still all about money. So if you can convince him or show him an opportunity for how he could actually be on the cutting edge of his industry by building a stage green business, um, you could, you could, that, that's going to create a bridge from orange into green. See? And that's really what understanding spiral dynamics will allow you to do is it'll allow you to be a great bridge builder. For example, to be able to show how spirituality is not in conflict with business, but how you can actually build a business that also promotes spiritual development of yourself and everyone around you. So there you're creating kind of a win-win scenario. Whereas, you know, if you take a stage orange person and tell him something like, hey, your business is just capitalistic garbage. All you're doing is just exploiting people. And uh, you need to quit your business and just go like, uh, go to meditation retreats and just like smoke pot and do psychedelics. You know, that's not gonna work for a stage orange person. They're not ready for that. They need to evolve to that level. So to this person, you might wanna frame it as, look, I understand that right now you're really passionate about your business and that's great. And you need to develop your business in order to kind of, you know, take care of your finances, take care of your family. All these are basic needs you have. So yes, put that into place. Nothing wrong with that. It's not evil. It's not bad. But also start to look towards the future because you're a person who's already into personal development. So you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to be satisfied chasing money all the time. You've, you already got a bunch of money. Be honest with yourself. Did it satisfy you? Did it make you happy? Did you make you happy? No. So what you really want is probably more love than money. So start to plan your business in such a way that you're moving more towards not just earning money, but also contributing love to the world. And that will actually make you more satisfied with the money that you're earning. And that will actually make you more motivated to work harder. And then that will actually help you to earn even more money. So it'll be a win-win. You could frame it like that. Also, another area of application is with developing and managing communities. So if you ever want to be a leader of a community, whether it's going to be an ashram, a religious community, a business community, a business organization, a nonprofit, um, anything like that, it would really help you to understand spiral dynamics. Because when you're leading people, it helps you to understand what drives and motivates the person that you are leading or talking to or in a relationship with or who's your business partner. See, and that's why Spiral Dynamics can be so valuable for business and for management is because in business, you're always making hiring decisions, firing decisions, you're, you're choosing business partners, you're choosing which companies you wanna work with, which kind of 
clients you want to attract and all of that. And how useful would it be to have a clear picture in your mind of like what stage of the spiral you want your business partner to be or you want your next hire to be? That can be... Um, that can be huge because in business, when you're running a business, you want to be clear at what stage your business is at, what stage your business is targeting, uh, like your clients, who's going to be buying your product or, or your service. Is it going to be stage blue people, orange people, green people, yellow people, turquoise people? That makes a big difference because that informs your entire marketing strategy. If you're new to business, you might make the foolish mistake of trying to market stage green solutions to stage orange people. And then you'll wonder why it didn't work. It can be very useful when you're starting a new business to understand spiral dynamics, to understand what level your business is at, what level you yourself are at, what level your employees are at, and what level your customers are at, and try to align all of those together. Because look, if your customers are stage blue and your business is stage orange and you're stage green, then you're going to have uh, chaos on your hands. It's very important when you're leading an organization that you have a, a common set of values. And that's exactly what Spiral Dynamics is about. Don't make the mistake of thinking that business only happens at stage orange. Business happens at every level of the spiral. There's stage red businesses. That's mostly criminal enterprises and mafias and stuff like that. And there's a, there's stage turquoise businesses. Of course, the most common businesses that all of us know are stage orange businesses. These are the McDonald's's, the Facebook's, and the, uh, the Microsoft's of the world. And then, you know, you have a few more evolved businesses. I would put Google around stage orange, half orange, half green. Maybe Apple is kind of half, half orange, half green. Um, and there, there are some smaller businesses who are solid orange, but, uh, but you probably haven't heard of them because they're not advertising themselves all over the place as much as McDonald's or, or Walmart or Facebook is. When you're developing your marketing strategy and you're trying to find your niche in business, it can be really useful to understand what stage you want to target. When looking for new business opportunities, if you're trying to invent a new product or a new service, it can also be extremely useful to think about it from the perspective of, okay, what stage am I at and what stage do I want my product or service to target? And also, like, what are the opportunities? So right now, maybe you get a sense that, okay, in your society right now, Maybe your society is at stage blue. Let's say you're in the Middle East somewhere. Stage blue society, okay. But you can see that your society is also evolving and that in the next 10 or 20 years, it'll start to move a little bit more orange. So you can already look ahead and say, okay, so what are the opportunities in my society for stage orange products, services, infrastructure that I could create and invent and build? I could be a leader. I can be at the cutting edge. Business is all about being at the cutting edge. Or if you're in the United States, you know, um, you want to start to look towards the future. What's coming in 10 or 20 years? Those business opportunities are probably going to be the next stage up. So right now we're, we're very orange, probably be towards green or towards yellow. And you can look at that from the perspective of like, if you're a software developer, you can look at, okay, what are the next stage, uh, spiral stage of software development? If you're a filmmaker, what's the next spiral stage of filmmaking? Or... Uh, if you're an, an author or you're an artist or you're a teacher, you know, whatever business you're running. Here's some examples of business ideas that uh, are connected with Spiral Dynamics. Think about creating a stage yellow education platform. An online platform that serves stage yellow. That could be a, a multi-million dollar business in the future. In the next 10, 20 years, I guarantee you that some smart person is going to create a stage yellow education platform and make millions of dollars doing this. That could be you. That could be your life purpose right there. 
Or how about creating a staged turquoise community? What if you were a visionary person who wanted to create a staged turquoise community? What would you have to do to be able to lead such a community? What kind of people would you need to attract to sustain such a community? What kind of infrastructure would need to be developed for this community? What would a staged turquoise community even look like? You could do that. You could build that. And you could earn good money doing that. That could be your whole life purpose. I guarantee that over the next 20 years, there will be many new staged turquoise communities that are started. And a handful of them will fail because the people starting them don't have a solid enough grasp of spiral dynamics. How about as an opportunity, if you're a consultant and what you do is you help businesses transition from stage orange to stage green. And that's like your niche and that's your life purpose. Because look, we've got so many stage green, stage orange businesses in the United States, for example, but they're also starting to hit the limit of where you can go with stage orange. They're hitting various kinds of environmental limits. They're hitting various kinds of limits with their employees and so forth. And it's actually starting to hurt their bottom line. And also the leaders who are leading these, these businesses, they want to go themselves evolve beyond orange into green, but they don't know how to do that. What if you were a business consultant who already went through that process, learned everything there is to know about that, all the traps and pitfalls and problems, and you were able to provide specific solutions and coaching and guidance to other entrepreneurs who are interested in transitioning their existing orange businesses into green. That could be a very viable and successful market for you. Or here's another opportunity. How about creating a stage green marketing company? Because there's a lot of stage orange marketing companies out there, but you know, these people who are running stage green businesses, they tend to, they, they tend to start to not like stage orange marketing anymore. They want stage green marketing, which is a more soft, more eco-friendly approach to marketing. It's not as cutthroat. You're marketing higher consciousness products and services. How do you do that? There's a whole set of challenges and problems with developing stage green marketing. And you can create a company that will help people to do that, to figure that out, to offer training or seminars or solutions for that. And that can be a very viable niche. You could also earn a lot of money, millions of dollars doing this. Of course, you would have to train yourself to know what you're talking about to actually offer legitimate solutions here. Here's another opportunity. How about you start a stage turquoise university? What would that look like? A stage turquoise university. It's hard to even envision that, you know, because that's so advanced. You have to really jump a few steps to even get to that. But if you're a visionary, ambitious person, you can already start to think about this, you know, what would a stage turquoise university look like? Hmm. What would the curriculum be? What would the textbooks look like? What kind of teachers would I hire? Would they be professors or would they be shamans? Who would they be? Would they be Indian gurus that I, that I hire from India? Where, where did I find these people? And would this be a, a physical brick and mortar university or would it be a digital online university? Maybe both or maybe one or maybe the other. You know, so you can, you can figure all these things out um, and then you can go and actually construct it and through trial and error actually create it. And you can have one of the first stage turquoise universities. Then you can get a lot of recognition for that if you make, make it successful and you can earn good money from that. And people will come and visit you from all around the world because there's not a lot of stage turquoise universities around the world. And think about maybe what kind of careers people might start after they finish your university. What kind of diplomas would you offer? That would be pretty cool. Think about how rewarding that would be too, because you would have a university would be, which would be like a visionary university that is a hundred years ahead of its time, which is basically where all the other universities need to go, but you will be one of the first to actually demonstrate that it works. And then once you do that, you can maybe travel around the country or around the, around the world and write books and talk about and help those universities who are right now stage green to evolve more towards turquoise. You might talk about what the challenges are. You might help them create a transition plan. 
change their curriculums, change their textbooks, change their funding sources, and all this kind of stuff. Here's another opportunity for you if you're an artist. How about you become a stage turquoise artist? Most artists these days are stage orange artists. Or maybe stage green. But what would a stage turquoise artist look like? Of course, that means you yourself would have to evolve up to stage turquoise. But then, what kind of art would perpetuate and promote and aggrandize the values of stage turquoise? Mmm, that's very interesting. There's so many opportunities for artists when it comes to the intersection of art and spirituality and psychology. There's a lot there. Because there's a lot of different types of art. We could be talking about painting, sculpture, filmmaking, video game making, music making. Um, I mean, you name it. Entirely new forms of art. Stage turquoise values probably require a new medium of art to be invented in order to really express those values. Maybe it's not going to be through video. Maybe it's not going to be through paint. Maybe it's not going to be through uh, books. Maybe it's going to be through virtual reality or some other new technology. And so you're going to have to find that intersection point between uh, turquoise values, artistry, and some maybe some new technology. And how do you combine all those together to create some cutting-edge new thing? Here's an idea for you. How about you become a stage turquoise scientist? What would that look like? A stage turquoise scientist. That's really interesting. If there are any uh, of you who are scientists in the audience, I challenge you to, to think about that for a week. Try to imagine what that might look like. How different that would be from most scientists in universities today. And what kind of breakthroughs you might make. Maybe you'd be studying the mind. Maybe you'd be studying spirituality. Maybe you would be combining those things with neuroscience or psychedelics and shamanism and God knows what else. There are so many possibilities. But also, don't just limit it to spirituality. Turquoise is not just spirituality in of itself. Every field of science can be turquoise science. Biology, chemistry, mathematics. Oh, well, mathematics isn't really a science, but um, you can think of it that way if you want. Um, social sciences, history. I don't have all the answers here. I'm just, I'm giving you opportunities. I'm, I'm trying to get your mind jogging, right? I'm trying to show you that there's so much stuff to mine here if you're really interested. And if you're looking for a life purpose, you're looking for something really valuable to do. That's what Sprout Dynamics can show you, is the next stage of the cutting edge of, of what mankind is going to be doing in the next 100 or 200 years. It's this stuff here. But it's precisely because it's so cutting edge and new, we don't even know what it, it looks like yet, perhaps. Which means that you're going to have to build it. You're going to have to imagine it, go through a process of trial and error, and then invent it. Speaking of invention, how about you become a stage turquoise inventor? What might that look like? Or what if you wanted to start a stage turquoise hospital? What might that look like? That would be a very different hospital than the stage orange hospitals that we know of today. Think about what kind of doctors would work there. Think about what the financing and insurance system would be like in a stage turquoise hospital. Think about what the funding sources would be like. Think about uh, the kind of clients you would have. They would be very different kinds of clients. Your whole approach to healthcare would be very different at that stage. Spiral Dynamics can also be very useful to help you evaluate teachers. If you're watching material on YouTube, or you're listening to some guru, or you're listening to a professor at your university, or you're listening to me, and you're trying to figure out, who do I believe? Who do I listen to? Who are the most advanced teachers? And which ones are the less advanced ones? Which ideas and ideologies should I be taking seriously? And which ones shouldn't I be? Well, use Spiral Dynamics to quickly 
judge where the teacher is at, what level are they talking from, what level values are they trying to promote. And that will allow you to isolate the best of the best teachers and teachings and to ignore all of the uh, lower ones, the ones that uh, are beneath you, so to speak. Also, it can help you to evaluate stuff that's way, way, way above you that you're not at, uh, that you're not developed to enough yet to, to really make use of. So you can kind of put a pin in that and come back to it 10 years later. Same thing with evaluating spiritual and religious teachings. Religion happens at all stages of the spiral, basically. So if you really want to understand religion, you need to take a spiral approach to that. If you're evaluating books, spiral dynamics can be very helpful there. It can also be helpful for evaluating media, entertainment, art, and analysis. So if you're listening to a talking head on YouTube or on TV or anywhere else, or you're reading it in a journal somewhere like the Wall Street Journal or New York Times, you're, you're reading an op-ed, some analysis about politics, about government, about healthcare, about universities, about sexuality, whatever it is, some analysis. Always ask yourself, what stage is the analysis coming from? That's super useful to know when you're analyzing a situation. If you're in a business meeting, and you're doing analysis on some business marketing problem, always ask yourself, what stage of the spiral is this analysis coming from? You can also apply spiral dynamics within relationships, sexuality, and dating. For example, who are you sleeping with? Are you sleeping with the right type of person at your level of the spiral? Or is the person that you're falling in love with and about to marry are they too low on the spiral for it to work? If you're a stage green woman and you're about to marry a stage mm, blue man, is that really going to be a smart move? Are you going to make that work? And not just romantic relationships. Think about all your relationships, your friendships, your family your work relationships. How useful is it to understand the values and motives that are driving the person that you're relating with? It's enormously useful. You can use Spiral Dynamics to evaluate your friends, to understand where your friends are coming from, to understand where your family is coming from. Spiral Dynamics will oftentimes explain why you and your family don't get along so well, or why your friends are holding you back, or why your spouse is holding you back. And that doesn't mean that you have to just judge them for being too low, too beneath you. Um, you can actually use Spiral Dynamics to help you to resolve the problem. First of all, you can discuss and teach Spiral Dynamics to your friends and family, if they're open enough and patient enough to listen through it. Um, but you can, you can help to, to expose them to, to the spiral. Um, then you can, you can help to build bridges. You can use the spiral to build bridges between you and their value system. Even if their value system is below yours, less developed than yours, you can still build bridges. You can still understand where they're coming from. So maybe your parents are very religious and dogmatic, and even though you're not that way, you can still understand it more from the spiral perspective. And maybe you can even learn to communicate with them in a way where you help to move them up and open their mind to new perspectives. Maybe you can frame some of the more advanced spiritual stuff that you're learning for me in a way that will make sense within their traditional Muslim or Hindu or Christian context that they're used to. Another way that spiral dynamics can be applied is when you're thinking about the kind of environment that you want to surround yourself with. What kind of city do you live in? What kind of country do you live in? Um, what kind of friends and people are around you? What kind of job do you have? Are all of these pulling you up or pulling you down on the spiral? And how could you change your environment? How could you move to a city or a country or a part of the world or uh, into the kind of organization that will actually pull you up 
maybe right now you're at stage green. And really what you need to evolve higher is you need to change your environment and put yourself in a more yellow environment. So how could you find yellow people? Maybe that means you got to move to a different city. Because in your city, there aren't any yellow people. There are no yellow organizations. Your communication skills can be greatly improved by understanding spiral dynamics. If you're a public speaker, if, like I said, you're a teacher, or you're even just trying to teach people one-on-one -on -one something, to be able to communicate your ideas clearly, it helps a lot to understand the value system of the recipient of your communication. Then you can tailor your message and your ideas in such a way that they understand it and it resonates with them and it can motivate them. Spiral dynamics can be applied to raising children. What stage of the spiral is your child at right now? And how can you communicate with him or give him the, the resources, the websites, the books, the, the videos, the courses, the, the, the schooling, the tutors that he or she needs in order to evolve to the next stage. So maybe right now your child is at orange and you want to help them to evolve to green and then to yellow and beyond. And it would be a mistake just to overwhelm the child with a bunch of turquoise yellow knowledge when the child isn't at that level yet. Historical analysis also benefits from understanding the spiral enormously. If you really want to understand history, go back through all the stuff you learned in school about history and reevaluate it from the spiral lens. Look at every war, at every conflict, at every political upheaval uh, throughout all of human history, going back to the ancient Romans and Egyptians, all the way through today, and just take a look and try to analyze it from these different colored stages. And you'll be amazed to see that most of the human conflicts and misunderstandings and disagreements were simply uh, um, a mismatching between the different stages. It was like a stage blue society comes into contact with a stage purple tribal people in South America, and then they wipe them out, something like that. Or maybe it's like one stage blue society, the Europeans, and another stage blue society, the, uh, uh, the Arabians, you know, during the Crusades, they come together and they're duking it out, two major civilizations duking it out for supremacy. And you could analyze like everything like that. You can even analyze individual historical people like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or uh, Richard Nixon or Julius Caesar. And you can read their biographies and get a sense for what their value system was and what their motives were and then match that up with their spiral level and then see how effective were they and how did they lead their, their troops and their, and their fellow citizens? How did they communicate to them? From what? from what value system to what value system. And then based on that, you'll see whether they were successful or whether they were failures. You can also apply spiral dynamics to help predict future trends, whether in business or in society. What's coming in the next 10, 20, 50, or 100 years? Within education, within healthcare, within government, within politics, within science, within medicine, within... Um, other countries, developing countries, what's happening? What's happening economically? What kind of political system will we have? Well, with spiral dynamics, you can get a pretty good idea of that. You can also get a good idea of what the obstacles will be, what the resistance will be, what the ego backlash will be. If you're trying to lead stage orange people into a stage green environment, then you can already predict using spiral dynamics what all of their fears and worries are going to be, and you can address those preemptively. Science is another area of application for spiral dynamics. Science isn't just an orange activity. Science also occurred at blue. Science occurred at, at, 
at red and even at purple, there's there's a version of science. And there will be versions of science at green, and yellow, and turquoise, and beyond. So what does that look like? How do we evolve science? Right now, science is mired in the stage orange materialism paradigm. Very, very limiting for scientists. If you want to be a cutting-edge scientist, you better start thinking ahead, looking to stage yellow and even turquoise, really. Science will be utterly transformed if it gets upgraded to stage turquoise. But this is something that one individual can't do. This is a, a collective effort. It's going to require systemic changes in the way that science is taught, understood, even what the word science means culturally. That will need to change. There's so much to say about science. I'll have uh, episodes in the future about how science works, what science is, and how to advance science into the future. I already mentioned art as an area of application. Um, let me just point out, for example, like just with one subfield of art, with video games. Most video games these days are stage orange video games. But if you want to be a cutting edge video game developer, you could start thinking about how to create stage green or yellow video games, or even turquoise. And what that, might that even look like? What is a stage turquoise video game? Honestly, I don't even know yet. But I know that there's going to be something there. It's just like a question mark. But you need to go and you need to explore that. And you might find some very cool stuff there. And you might be one of the first stage turquoise video game developers. But really, this applies to any art, any medium, whether writing, movie making, music, or anything like that. If you're teaching spirituality, if you want to be a spiritual teacher, it's very important you understand spiral dynamics. Because... People will come to you from all levels of the spiral. You'll have stage blue people coming to you for advice, and stage orange ones, and green ones, and yellow ones, and they will all have their own unique fears, and objections, and questions, and concerns, depending at what stage of the spiral they're at. And if you're, let's say, going to be at turquoise, you're this advanced spiritual teacher, and you got a stage blue person coming to you, you got to know how to connect with that, because that's many stages in between blue and, and turquoise. That's a big gap that you need to bridge. And if you want to be an effective spiritual teacher, you can't just be spouting the same old non-dual stuff all the time. You got to be like connecting with, the, with whatever level the person is at. And uh, lastly, the area of application is your life purpose. If you've taken my life purpose course and you're trying to figure out what your life purpose is, you can use Spiral Dynamics to help you to find a higher life purpose than you otherwise would. I feel like a lot of people who take the life purpose course end up kind of like setting their sights too low and they end up having like a stage orange life purpose, which is just basically like starting a business of some kind and making it successful. But like I challenge you to actually create a stage yellow or a turquoise life purpose. And just to even spend time ruminating and imagining what that might even look like in your particular chosen field. So maybe your life purpose is to be a great teacher or a great speaker or a great entrepreneur. Well, yeah, it's nice to have a life purpose of becoming a great entrepreneur, but I challenge you to become a turquoise entrepreneur or a yellow entrepreneur. That's so much more interesting than just becoming uh, a cookie cutter orange entrepreneur another one of these Silicon Valley uh, CEO types. And you will be so much more connected with that life purpose than you will with an orange one. So whatever life purpose you have right now, let's say you took my course and you came out with your life purpose. I want you to look at that, evaluate it, and ask yourself, what set of values is that life purpose serving on the spiral? Is it orange? Green, yellow, or turquoise. And then, wh wherever you peg yourself, ask yourself, okay, how could I kick it up another notch? What would that look like? What if I had basically the same life purpose, but it was one level higher? So there you go. Those are some of the areas of application. As you can see, there's a lot here. It's exciting stuff. Really, 
This whole episode is all about opportunities. Opportunities for our society, our opportunities for uh, developing countries in the, around the world, opportunities for yourself and your life purpose and your business. So in order to apply Spiral Dynamics, what you need is three steps. First, you must learn it. And it'll take you a good 20, 30 hours of studying the theory, reading the books, listening to my talks about it to learn the theory. Number two is that you must stop judging all the different stages on the spiral. Don't get lost in the judging and the pigeonhole, pigeonholing of people, but rather set aside your biases. Be open to the entire spiral. Be open to exploring and building bridges across the spiral and looking at the world from different perspectives. And number three is that you got to develop yourself at least to stage yellow. Because it's only at stage yellow that now you're at tier two and now you're really able to, to, to move up and down the spiral and see the world from all these different perspectives. And then you can really start to apply this model to transform your life and to transform society around you. Remember that of any human invention or system, you can always ask, number one, which stage was it created by? And number two, which stage is it enabling? And also number three, which stage is it suppressing or demonizing or judging? And that's a very helpful little tool in analyzing various systems and human creations. So finally, just remember that spiral dynamics is a scientific theory. It's not just something I pulled out of my ass. Spiral dynamics is based on real world research all around the world, not just Western societies, but all societies, various cultures across many generations. We have been studying and looking at the psychological development of human value systems. And so just like Newtonian mechanics is a scientific theory, which is effective at helping you to understand how objects move and helping you to make predictions. Well, likewise, you can use spiral dynamics as a scientific theory to help you to grow yourself, to architect a more functional society, to create amazing innovations, to get a glimpse into what the future is going to hold. And you can also very simply use it to earn lots of money, fame, praise, and fulfillment, if that's what you're after. If you're at stage orange and all you care about is money, fame, praise, and fulfillment, well, Spiral Dynamics is just a tool that will enable you to do that. But of course, I challenge you to use it more responsibly than that. I challenge you, if you're creating a business, to create a business that is at least stage green or higher, such that your business is not just fulfilling your own personal needs and making you rich and successful, but is actually helping to elevate uh, all of mankind helping to raise the consciousness of mankind in some way so that it's a win-win. You're winning, but also your environment is winning as a result of your work and your business and your life purpose. All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please click that like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. On there, you will find various exclusive resources that will open your mind further. So some of my deepest insights I post on my blog, check that out. Check out my life purpose course. If you haven't already, check out my book list where I will be posting some additional books on Spiral Dynamics applications coming soon. And uh, come check out the forum where you can discuss all this. And lastly, I'll just say this. Imagine what a stage yellow society might look like. Spend some time over the next week just letting your mind wander and kind of vision into the future. What would a stage yellow society look like? And all the different elements of society we've been talking about, from healthcare to education to politics to our legal system, all of that. What would that look like? That's a really good exercise. Maybe spend a few hours actually trying to write it out. It should inspire you. Because what you're looking at is you're looking at the next 200 years of human development right there. That's where we're headed. Whether you like it or not, we're headed there. 
You can help to consciously create that, though. You can play a role. And what role do you want to play? There are so many different roles to play. There's hundreds, thousands of different roles. Whether you want to be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or a politician or in the military, whatever you want to do, there's a way you can do that such that you help to advance society up to this vision of yellow. Wouldn't it be cool to align your life with that? Such that you're working with the larger forces of evolution. Because what society is, is society is much larger than you and me. No one individual is creating it. No one individual is in charge of it. It really just is an offshoot of the entire evolutionary process that has been going on from the very beginning of this planet for four billion years or however long. Uh, the very same mechanism that gave rise to your body and my body is giving rise to this society that we're in. But also that very force is within you. It's inside of you and it's running your mind and you can, you can channel that force and you can use it consciously to create for the greater good. And you can enjoy that process and you can derive deep meaning and satisfaction from doing that rather than just working at McDonald's flipping cheeseburgers for somebody or being a secretary doing somebody's dirty work or working in some sort of giant oil company, um, you know, um, making money, uh, but at the cost of harming the environment. That's not nearly as fulfilling as what I'm trying to point you towards here. So think about that. Let your mind wander a bit, dream a bit. And then from that is where you get the motivation and the passion to then want to go create something amazing. Before you can create something amazing, you got to be able to imagine it and it has to be able to inspire you. So whatever that means for you, whether it's within art or within business or within government or within healthcare, it doesn't matter. Find what that is for you and turn that into your life purpose.